turnout to this talk by Dee Dutto, who's one of our own uh, in the Pace Department. Now, this talk is entitled Bill and Hillary Clinton Secrets and Complications. So, it should be a pretty good talk. Uh, and Dee is doing his PhD on uh, the Clintons and counterterrorism. So, without any further ado, we give it up for Dee Dutto. Thank you, President Riley. Uh, I thought I would pitch this. I didn't realize the audience was this. And I thought and thought, what should I kind of talk about? Well, the scandals you know more, of, much more about than I do. But I thought I'd give you some background to scandals, because then otherwise I might lose your interest. Um, I would talk also about how we got here. You know, because if you think about it, US is a pretty big country. And if the best they can do is one 70 plus year old woman with her dodgy past, and uh, another 71 year old man with even dodgier present and past, says something about US politics, which is my first plug that you all should come and study US politics. But more <laughs> importantly, is to try and kind of give you a bit of perspective and obviously answer you the big question you all want to know, who's going to win the election. So if you're going to wait till then, I might have an answer for you because I've spoken to some very important people and I've got the an answer for you. <laughs> So I thought I would start with who are the Clintons? Who are these people? You know, what makes them this way? And I can tell you there are some interesting perspectives on when you get to see who the Clintons are. And how did we get here? So how, what is the process? And what's going to happen? Uh, by the way, those of you expecting political theory, I don't do theory. That's my people that I teach will tell you, uh, I think I do more about the realities of day-to-day -day politics. Bill and Hillary Clinton are perhaps the most unique political couple in modern day politics. And if you think about two people in any country around the world, you know, except for the Philippines, where they had Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, there ain't that many people that have gone to the leadership at that level of a significant country. There are places in Chile and Argentina, the Perons did it, there are other people in Asia that have done it. But for a major Western power, there are very few political couples that have done, done this road. But, saying that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, you know, what makes them. Now, let me do a quick disclaimer. Unlike what President Riley said, uh, Bill Clinton is not my friend, right? Uh, I met him once on a golf course when I was in business, and I shook hands. He's a charming man, and I know why a lot of women fall for him. <laughs> 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 He had beautiful blue eyes, didn't he? <laughs> He's pretty impressive. Uh, I've never met Hillary, but uh, my research is helped by the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Library. Uh, but they don't pay me, I don't pay them, so therefore our relationship is purely pragmatic. The Clinton Library has helped me. You will see some of the pictures I have here are a little bit more um, pictures that you don't get normally on the internet. Well, let's talk about the two people CV. You know, when I said these were impressive, they are impressive people, because William Jefferson Clinton, if there was somebody who was going to become president, having Jefferson as your middle name always helps. Uh, he was president between 1993 and 2001. He took over from George H.W. Bush, and before that, he was the 40th and 42nd governor. Why those two? Because he lost his governorship in, in between of a state called Arkansas, which is right down in the south. It's one of the poorest states. 
and I'll have some pictures for you of what Arkansas looks like, because I spent a bit of time out there, and he was also the Attorney General. But the thing that will probably impress you is his academic record. Throughout his school days, Bill Clinton was pretty much top of his class. And at Georgetown University, where I was this, uh, this summer, he was also, you know, when I talked to the people who met him, talked to him, he was like a stellar student. And so he won a scholarship to go to Oxford. And it's the first time, and Bill talks about his kind of journey, that this is a guy who had never set foot outside America. He came from a very, very you know, poor state going to Oxford, England. He never even knew where Oxford, England was. He didn't know that. And he did, got what's called a Rhodes Scholarship, which is a very prestigious thing that very few people get. And then he came back and he did his postgraduate at Yale University, where he um, also was top of his class. And he was a great lawyer. Uh, he became a lawyer. Not a good lawyer, I'm told. He was an okay lawyer, but a good student. Hillary Rodham, not Hillary Clinton, uh, Hillary Rodham is our current presidential candidate. But she was the Secretary of State, and she was the U.S. Senator uh, in New York State. But she has been First Lady of the U.S., 1993 to 2001. And this was not a First Lady who kind of just uh, makes cakes and does stuff. She was responsible for building the first version of the Democratic health care program, which did not go well. And it's one of those things that gave her a political reputation. So Hillary, by the time she comes to 2016, has already had a significant political background. That's one of the first things to understand, that this is not somebody America didn't know about. They knew about as first lady, they knew about her before, even before then, because she had agitated about women's rights, about education, children's education, things that are very close to Hillary's heart. And she had also gone to Wellesley and uh, at Yale. Uh, and again, she was a top student, right? So we are talking two very clever buddies coming together. Uh, these are two incredibly clever people. And that, perhaps, I would suggest, is the first weakness in their personality. And I'll, come, I'll develop that theme as I go along. So when people say that two people, more than Eleanor and Franklin, this is the Roosevelt, who, were, who are reckoned to be the, perhaps the most famous US presidents of all time, uh, you know, Bill and Hillary Clinton helped define the political life of the generation, my generation. When I was in my 20s, Bill was the president. And therefore, to me, Bill was the guy who was, you know, after years of Reagan and Thatcher, we suddenly had Bill Clinton, you know, this good-looking, this amazing guy who had come over and he was going to change our world. He was our Obama. And, uh, and he spoke, spoke a language. He spoke about bridge to the 21st century. He spoke, he spoke a language we understood. And when you look at these cute pictures of Bill and Hillary, that tells a, a story in itself. Bill came from the South, the Deep South. And he was brought up at a time of segregation, of Jim Crow. He came up at a time when his world in Little Rock, they had busing to bring African Americans to college. He grew up in a time of extreme, extreme poverty, harshness, racial tensions, and one of the things that I found from reading his autobiography called Clinton, My Life, is that Bill's value system was put into place in those years. He kind of, you know, he kind of started thinking more about, I want to treat everybody equal, right? He, he, he had this kind of belief, everybody deserves a chance. Everybody wants a chance. That was how Bill Clinton saw life. He wasn't one of those people who kind of thought about it in a kind of very political way about thinking about, about that. He thought about it very much about rights and wrong. 
develop something is right or something is wrong. Right? Hillary, on the other hand, was, no, was very different. She came from a privileged background. Her, she came from a place, and I'll show you her uh, family home, was, um, you know, Park Ridge, Illinois. <laughs> Park Ridge, Illinois, uh, which is a very <coughs> affluent suburb, and I can show you the picture <coughs> of Bill and, Bill and Hillary's house, separate houses they were brought up in. And these two people, and Hillary was a Republican, right? Hillary was never a born Democrat. And until her teens and early, early teens, she was a Republican. She never came into the Democratic Party. And in a way, that kind of explains another source of Hillary, is that the Democrats, uh, some, some of the Republicans, some of the mainstream non-Trump Republicans, feel that she's one of them that has come somehow been seduced onto the dark side of the left. But, you know, because Hillary, when she was at college, she was, an, in, in the, she was at university, she was definitely, you know, the, her kind of demeanor as what she talked about. But then she talks about her conversion. Now, the interesting thing, when I looked out into this, about her conversion, she said she went to a speech by Martin Luther King, the great civil rights guy, and she was converted to the cause of Demo uh, Democrats. Now, the fact is, Bill Clinton mentions this in his book. And you kind of think, hang on, did, is, was that what converted her? Because throughout her political legacy hasn't been one of somebody who has been a national Democrat. Because she was somebody who voted against gay rights uh, when she was a senator. She wasn't this kind of so-called lefty that the right portrays as that. Uh, uh, she voted for the Iraq War. Bill, this is Bill's house. Now this is, you know, a pretty <coughs> modest house. Unfortunately, somebody put fire, set fire to it recently, and a bit of it has been burned down. But <coughs> Bill, when you look at his career, was a national Democrat. You know, one of his great moments is the fact that he shook hands with the great Democrat John F. Kennedy. And there's a picture of Bill and John F. Kennedy shaking hands. And you can see that Bill has got that passion of a Democrat. Uh, but Hillary, very few pictures exist in Hillary's early days of her you know, talking about any of these causes. The first cause she kind of starts, which is kind of starts being to the left of center, is this thing about education for children. That's what you see. And when you look at Hillary's background, you know. This is this very, I mean, this picture doesn't do it justice, but it's this enormous house that it comes from. She comes from a very affluent and wealthy background. And she was a great, you know, she was a good student leader. She had a time in student politics, but she was always the right of center. She was no, nowhere near as right as trumpet, but definitely as right of center. But then these two people meet, and they fall in love. And there are some very, very saccharine-like story of this bearded Bill Clinton <laughs> proposing to Hillary, and you know, they do their selfie. This is pre-selfie day, and you know he says he's tongue-tied about proposing, and you know he goes through this. And if you recently saw Bill Clinton's speech at uh, the Democratic convention, and he talked about his love for Hillary, I don't know whether that was put on or whether he really meant it. Uh, the cynical in me saying he's been a politician, the realist in the romance in me says that he still loves the woman. But there is this kind of great partnership and romance that's built together. There is these two people, two highly, highly intelligent people, right, who come together and kind of says, right, we're going to, be, we're going to come together. And they have, a, they have a game plan. They want to do things. They want to change the world. They're not sure how they want to change the world, but they want to change the world. Remember, this is the late, late 60s, 70s. There is this idealism in there. There is this spirit of, you know, spirit of counterculture, idealism. You know, Bill, that's a picture of him taken in Ireland, you know, with his bearded look. And, you know, he says he, he, he smoked marijuana, but he never inhaled. You know, those of you have tried it, one, one, no, that's bullshit. 
but, uh, you know, but the thing is, Bill is one of those guys who kind of just, you know, is, is, is comes over as a genuine, oh shucks, you know, I'm a southern boy, and here I'm dating a very, you know, sort of eastern liberal establishment girl, and she's the cleverer one, and so and so forth. So this whole romance developed, and he devotes pages and pages uh, in his autobiography about how he went through a proposal and how he go goes about doing this. So they get married, and they come to a place called Little Rock. <coughs> Little Rock is a town in Arkansas. <coughs> they start off as lawyers. They're both hardworking lawyers, and they have their first baby with the name Chelsea. Um, and then Bill, you know, he's, he becomes Attorney General and he becomes the Governor of Arkansas. And that's where the Bill Clinton starts emerging. The Bill Clinton that people know of or read about in history. There's a man who's kind of, you know, who has got a mission, who, who is seen as a future president. Uh, the Bill has some tough times. He has tight, tough times on education. And he puts Hillary onto education to help him sort his education problems. <coughs> Bill has some tough times on getting the budget passed. He gets Hillary's help in getting the budget passed. So you're starting to see a model of a co-presidency, yeah, co-governorship. It's not Bill doing all his own. This is a partnership where they're working together Husband and wife, they're kind of, each is investing in the other's career. Obviously, Bill didn't invest that much in Hillary, because Hillary was still having to go out and earn a, earn a living as a lawyer. Bill, however, Hillary was investing her intellectual capital on Bill's career to build up his, help him through his political challenges. And then comes the moment he's elected president. He goes up against a guy called George H.W. Bush, an old guy uh, seen as a, one of the you know, establishment uh, in America. And Bill, beautiful wife, daughter, the ideal couple, America falls in love with them. They, they buy into the Clinton image. They buy into his idea of the bridge to the 21st century. And Bill starts building his political legacy. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about Bill to Bill Spiller politics. We can, if you have any questions, I can get into that later on. But Bill's presidency was had ups and it had downs. But my point to you guys is don't see Hillary without Bill and don't see Bill without Hillary. This is a political partnership. But do people warm to the Clintons? So what's the why the problem with the Clintons? Well, there's. It seems to be a problem with a lot. I have a simple model here. There's three things that determine this whole debate about how Hillary, this situation, got there. There's the unexplained secrets. And I'll talk to you about some of the secrets, some of the question marks that are out that are there despite what Trump says. You know, Trump has gone into the extreme. There are still question marks. And if Trump had been more reasonable, and it, or there had been a more reasonable Republican candidate, he could have really gone to town on Hillary's track record. There is the unquestioning loyalty, and I'll talk about it, and the unbelievable levels of dislike that Hillary has in, in the USA. <coughs> this is what Bill Clinton says. I came to accept secrets as normal part of my life. Now, this is a guy who came from a broken home. His mother and his father divorced. His father was going out with underage women. And, and this is not Trump, this is Bill himself playing this. Uh, and his mother was also having an, an enormous amount of affairs. So it was a failed marriage. And not only was there a failed marriage, there was also spousal violence. <coughs> uh, I think his mother shot his father, shot, father shot his father, they missed, but there is a lot of guns and things going on. This is Bill's background. 
This is what I build background has been before he becomes Bill Clinton. And, you know, his whole thing is about secrets. It's all about keeping it inside. It's about, I'm not going to tell people. I'm not going to, you know, there are all these dark secrets. And, and he kind of tries and justifies this. He says, oh, this is people attacking me. But the reason people are attacking him is that he's very transparent about some of the things he's done. And the first one is this thing called white water. And white water was the first instance where Bill and Hillary both got into deep trouble. White water was an investment that Bill and Hillary went in with Jim and Susan McDougall. Story is so far, so good. People have a bit of money, they want to invest, they go into taking some wasteland and build some holiday homes. Great, great entrepreneurial spirit. However, the business fails. Business goes bust. Fine, nobody, okay, businesses go, go up, go down, no problem. So Jim and Susan McDougall go off into a bank. They start in the bank. In America, it's very easy to open a bank, private bank, and they open a bank called Madison Guarantee and Savings. The Madison Guarantee and Savings <coughs> also fails. At which point, because it's a bank, the federal authorities start looking into it. And when they start investigating, they see there are some problems in the whole business plan of the federal, um, of this Madison Guarantee. And they kind of go, oh, okay, let's look into it. <coughs> Give the case to the FBI. So Hillary's little brush with the FBI recent is not. Hillary has a track record with the FBI. And the FBI start looking into it. And they find that there is a guy called David Hale, who Clinton has pressurized pressurized into giving a loan. Now, this is a contributor to the Democratic Party in Arkansas. Bill Clinton persuaded them, persuaded David Hale to give Jim uh, and Susan McDougall a loan. Not just that, this is the guy who took over as governor of Arkansas, a guy called Jim Guy Tucker, great names down south, is charged with corruption and fraud and goes to jail. So all of this builds up. Now, Hillary Clinton's firm, called the Rose Law Firm, is doing the defense. And suddenly papers go missing. And people say, where are these papers? Now, Subsequently, these papers are found in the White House. And, but it starts this whole rumor cycle going. Well, were they guilty? Were they not guilty? Suddenly, America is asking of its first couple, what's happening here? Now, remember, America's previous experience with corruption had been Nixon, right? They hadn't had, you know, whatever people said over Reagan, there had, nobody has ever pinned a corruption charge on it, and nobody had ever pinned a corruption charge on George H. W. Bush. But they managed to pin a corruption charge on somebody who is a president. And suddenly, when you're a president, it gets the politics gets involved, and they appoint a special prosecutor. And suddenly, there are secrets. They're being evasive. Now. A lot of the evasion was not evasion, if you look into that case. It's basically Hillary saying, well, I can't be bothered with this. Or Bill saying, I can't be bothered. This is just big. Republicans causing trouble for me. And part of it was true, as I will come on to talk about. But this is its thing. Our family policy was don't ask, don't tell. This is directly from his book, Bill Clinton, My Life. Family policy, don't ask, don't tell. Now, this starts creating the image of doubt in people's minds. 
And the DAO becomes, you know, there's Fox News, there's all these other channels. This is before Breitbart. This is before any of the Tea Party. This is a period when America is pretty much still, you know, there's Republicans and Democrats, there's none of the other strains. And then we have these. Now, I've had to write the names though, because I, there have been so many I forget uh, the names. But um, these two are Juanita Broderick and uh, Kathleen, uh, sorry, Paula Jones. Now, there's charges of rape, groping, all sorts of things by these two ladies. Unproved, dubious witnesses, and if you look at it independently, there's not enough evidence to say that there's been a case here. And it's the same with the lady on the right, Kathleen Wiley. But the lady on the left, or yeah, right here in red, is Jennifer Flowers. And just before the 94 election, uh, 94 congressional elections, this all comes out. And this is at that time, white water is going on, and people are saying, is Clinton lying? So is Clinton a liar? Now, people in politics say, oh, so-and-so is being you know, economical with the truth, or being mendacious. And after all, the president had to be a liar. And suddenly, the whole reputation of his presidency is on the line. And then there's Monica. <laughs> now, this is not the most flattering picture of Monica, but this is the, one of the pictures that I got out of the Clinton Library. They were very reluctant to give this to me, but this is Monica and Clinton when they were working together. Now, from Monica's perspective, they said we were both adults, uh, and it was consensual. But here's the thing. She's 22, and he's in his mid-40s, and he's the president. So if the president says, oh, by the way, do whatever you do, and you know, you ain't going to say, oh, well, Mr. President, you know, I'm just an intern, I'm just going to say no. You know, there is a power here, there is power that comes from the office. And so, to my mind, this is an abuse, you know, this is an abuse of his. And he's evasive. He tries everything under the sun. He is going around talking about, oh, this is a Republican plot, there is this, all these people against me. And he starts coming across as evasive. There are too many secrets. There's too much doubt. And suddenly the presidential world is looking tawdry. Imagine, you know, people like us who kind of go, oh, Bill Clinton is great. We love him. We voted for him. But the whole thing is now beginning to look like Bill Clinton is a... Uh, what kind of a guy is he? You know, what, what, what kind of a guy is the guy who's the president of this, you know, Okay, now we've come to accept some of the narratives of Trump, but Bill Clinton, you know, it's like, hey, is this really the case? And it, it, it kind of starts becoming, you know, you start looking at Bill Clinton differently. He's a guy leading parallel lives. And, you know, Hillary turns around and says, I'm not going to be some of this Tammy Wynette type lady, you know, Tammy Wynette or Tammy Wynette. Just, if you're not into country and western, is the goddess of country and western music. You know, and she wrote this song called Stand By Your Man, which is a real, you know, if you want to get into Tammy one out, go for it. But, you know, uh, certainly it would go down well with the Trump crowd. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, and Hillary starts saying, I'm not kind of this Tammy one out, stand by your man. It's this kind of whole thing about, you know, we're better. We are somehow better. We're better than you guys. And we're not going to. But, you know, all this time, people are thinking, why is she not fuming, foaming at him? Why is this woman accepting this amount of, you know? So, particularly with younger voters, it's kind of, you know, why is this woman accepting this amount of, you know, what's the matter with her? Yeah, most women, you know, we're writing this is free Twitter, free Facebook, you know, the, in the newspaper columns they're writing about, you know, what is wrong with this woman? Why is she not thumping it? Why is she not shooting it? You know, yeah, he's been so bad. But, you know, she says, no, I'm going to stand.
stand by him. So this whole thing about Clinton's credibility and doubt comes to pass. She leaves office. And he's, he's gone. Then we see the Clinton Foundation is announced. And the Clinton Foundation is Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea. Now, the Clinton Foundation, uh, who I have to say have been very helpful, their job is to help countries. They go out, like the Jimmy Carter Foundation, the Ronald Reagan Foundation, each president. But unfortunately, there is a link between business and donations and access and questions start getting asked. And again, instead of being open, <coughs> hey, you know, there's nothing, you know, here's our account, it's all this evasiveness. And a lot of the evasiveness are not done by the Clintons this time, they're done by the people that work for him. And then you know about the email story as well. <coughs> yeah. I mean, I work with State Department people, I know State Department people, how the hell can you tell the Secretary of State, oh, by the way, send all your classified mails? On. I mean, I, I just don't get it, right? Uh, how is it that it happened like that? But let's say it did, and let's say nobody prevented it. My guess is some junior flunky was sent to Hillary Clinton to tell her what to do it. She kind of went, well, do you really mind? And the power of the Clintons came into being. But that's just a theory we won't know till, you know, the records are released. But the fact is, this is a woman who is Secretary of State in 2009, right? In the internet era when nothing is private, and yet she's using her home server for diplomatic mail. It's not corrupt, as Trump puts it. It's just bizarre, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, OK, there is a legality. I mean, yes, she may not have sent Qualified. Now, the Republicans are portraying this as somehow there is a link between the Clinton Foundation and asking for money. Because if you get a request for money, and you're the king of Morocco, and it says from the Secretary of State of the United States, because that's the mail server she's using, that means a lot power than if it says from the Clinton Foundation. People are kind of saying, What's going on here? Now, all of Hillary, Hillary's people will say, oh no, she never did it, and possibly she didn't. But my evidence shows that there is some, you know, there is some <coughs> lack of cl clarity, lack of evasiveness. And then we come to the most latest thing, which you may not have even heard about. This is their current house in a place called Japakapo. Now, those of you who live in a house or know about a house, or, or your parents' house, Anytime you do any <coughs> filling around in the house in terms of knocking out walls or whatever, you need a building inspector. But the Clintons decide to spend $2 million in renovating the house. They don't ask anybody. They don't say permission. They don't ask the city council. They don't ask anybody. Why? Oh, just because you're the president or ex-president and you're the secretary of state? Back off. Lack of clarity, lack of clarity, secrets. Now, you know, they probably told their flunky and the flunky forgot to tell, but ultimately that doesn't wash, especially if you're going to stand as president. You can't do that. You know, it's not corrupt, as Trump puts it, but you can't have lack of clarity. And I love the Clinton, I find it incredible that, you know, they do it this way. And you start kind of beginning to investigate a little bit more about the Clintons. And there's this privacy, there's this kind of secrecy. But the other word that comes through is loyalty. And this, I believe, is the core of what the problem is. They value loyalty, and they are unquestioningly loyal to some of their people. But let me take you back to Little Rock. These are my pictures of Little Rock. When do you think this was? Anybody know? What day of the week? <coughs> Just 
Speak up. What day of the week would you say this is literal? Monday. Yeah, it's a Monday morning, nine o'clock in the morning. Not exactly the New York City, is it? <coughs> Guys, we're talking small town America here. This is small town America. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows their Uncle Goober or their Auntie, Auntie May. Everybody knows everybody. And that explains why these two, who are Jim and Susan McDougall of Whitewater, got shown so much loyalty. If I was president of the USA and these people were on my friends, I would drop them. Right? He would just drop these people who are real dodgy. That's their only way. Funny, funny. I would drop these people. Yet the Clinton stand by them. But the rest of their money. But these people are dodgy. The FBI says they're dodgy. <coughs> and then the worst thing, and this is what gets about America, is as you know, when the president leaves office, he can pardon people. Right? Normally the president pardons turkeys at Christmas. He can also pardon people for many things. And President pardoned <coughs> these people just before he left office. <coughs> Figure that. Then if you look into his politics, this guy is a guy called Christopher Warren. He was his Secretary of State. And one of my conclusions of my academic PhD work is saying this guy's failure was why we had 9-11. Not Bill Clinton's, this guy. Because he did not put enough resources into fighting Al-Qaeda. He did not understand the phenomenon of terrorism. He did not get the phenomenon of terrorism. He did not devote enough time to the phenomenon of terrorism. And it was him, rather than his successor, because Clinton had two Secretary of State, they called Madeleine Albright. And Albright got it. Albright understood the challenge. But Chris Warren. But how did Chris Warren get the job? Well, one of the things my research found is that when Clinton had a choice of some of the best minds in sec to be the Secretary of State, and remember, the Secretary of State is not is the chief diplomat of America, right? It's the, it's the president's personal envoy. It's the one that makes it happen. The one area where the president of the USA has more effect than any other is foreign policy, and this is the most the one area where where you know Secretary of State are critical, right? People like John Kerry, <coughs> people like Madeleine Albright, Hillary Clinton. You know, these, these are very powerful jobs. And he gives it to his campaign manager? What's his track record? Well, you look at his track record. Well, you may or may not remember that this guy was in the Jimmy Carter administration. And what was his record on the Jimmy Carter administration? Well, he was in the Jimmy Carter administration. Jimmy Carter administration had the Iran hostage crisis. Did they get their own hostage out? No. Who fell? He fell. He was the chief negotiator. But why did Clinton give him the job? Misplaced loyalty. You know, this. And then this guy, Doug Band. Douglas Band. Douglas Band has worked for Clinton for many years, worked for both Bill and Hillary. And Douglas Band is the guy who looks after the Clinton Foundation. But Douglas Band also runs a company called Taneo. And Taneo is a guy, is a company that solicits money for Clinton's business interest as opposed to Clinton's charitable interest. Where's the blind? Even Chelsea Clinton got worried about this and she said, I don't want my father becoming like Tony Blair. <laughs> you know, going around asking for money for all this. Because that, that's what Doug Band was pretty much saying. You know, you give, give me access, I'll give you access to the president. I mean, remember, ultimately this is the president of the USA. I did a golf game with this guy, and that, you know, cost my company a lot of money. <coughs> yeah, all I got to do was shake his hand. I didn't get to say to him, if I knew what I was going to end up, I would have said, change your foreign policy. But, you know, I never, never got to do that. <coughs> But, you know, that's what, that's, there is this thin line between business and politics. 
And suddenly, people start asking questions. And this becomes a challenge. Then it's Hillary. Who is this lady? The lady on whom a baby, who is Clinton's chief of staff. Well, who am I betting? That's nothing wrong with him. He's great. <coughs> but there is something wrong with the guy she was married to, whose name was Anthony Weiner. Uh, you may or may not have heard of Anthony Weiner. He was standing as a congressman, and he was a guy who uh, was texting pictures of his genitalia to underage women. And his congressional campaign team of the weeks. And that, who am I betting? Husband, or lady. <laughs> and yet, Clinton sticks by her. You know, yet Clinton stuck by her. And he kind of goes, you know, in politics, it doesn't happen like that. Now, is this misplaced loyalty? Is this. But, then you start looking at it from the other side. <coughs> and you see this lady called Mira <coughs> Tandon. No filter nearer. If you ever read her tweets, it's amazing. She uses more four-letter words than Trump. <laughs> and uh, no filter nearer or nearer tangent is is like she is Hillary stormtrooper. And she said, "I." And this is her quote: "I would do whatever Hillary needs, always. I owe her a lot. I'm a loyal soldier." And this sort of relationship creates the problems that we see in Hillary Clinton's life, that people don't <coughs> tell her when she's doing wrong or when she's not being clear about stuff. If people had advised her well, I believe that email controversy wouldn't have happened. You know, because she's not, a, she's, not a, you know, she's not a stupid woman. She's a smart lady. She knows she, she's got one of the most powerful jobs in the world. She's been badly advised by these people, and that's because people just say yes to her. And that's happened with Bill, with his women, and it's people happening with that. And that's part of the explanation why. So, this starts building a story about hating the Clintons. And I kind of took those are the kind of people who absolutely detest Clinton, will not vote for her. The traditional Republicans who were considering would not vote for her. There are people who don't like the Clintons, regardless of parties. They just don't like the Clintons because of the history. There are the Green Party supporters who think that Clinton is too right. There are people who voted for Bernie Sanders who think Clinton is too right wing. And there are people who voted for Bill Clinton who thinks part of Bill Clinton's problem is Hillary. <laughs> now, why? Well, partly, Hillary has been somebody who's challenged barriers. And here's the positive story about Hillary. Hillary has cha challenged barriers. You know, despite of what people <coughs> say about America, I've lived in America, I've worked in America, and I still work with Americans, there is an element of misogyny there. And you know, they say it's so, it's so easy to hate the Clintons because they were successful, but Americans tend to not like ambitious women with land forces. She is ambitious, she is stood up for it, she's talked about it. But you know, there have been people in America who have talked about it. Susan Anthony, Martin Luther King, who have changed the gender, but they haven't had secrets and lies in their background. They've been clean about their past. They've been open about their past. And as she has annoyed a lot of traditional women, this quote, I suppose I could have stayed home and baked cookies and had tea, was something she said in the 1970s. This is pre, you know, feminism was coming into thing. And she did, said this about the mother of the nation, because George H.W. Bush's wife was this elderly lady. And she was seen very much as the mother figure. And everybody loved her. And she asked why Hillary was going by her name, Hillary Rodham. And she said, no, I'm not a Clinton, I'm a Rodham. And people kind of go, hey, it was 
seen as, you know, as somebody who was strident. She wasn't trying to be strident. She wasn't trying to be, but it's the way she put it. And in a way, that's the problem. Has been, that has been the problem, is that you know, she has created issues by trying to challenge some of the issues. And remember, this is a lady who, in eight days' time, could be the first woman president in the United States history. You know, given that it's taken them 250 years, and countries like India, Israel, uh, United Kingdom has had women prime ministers, this is a pretty much a tragedy. And so you kind of go, hello, you know. So she's had to challenge the stereotype. Don't get me wrong. She's had to challenge it. But challenging is fine. But there comes with it a responsibility. And I feel that with the secrets and the lies and the stuff, there has not been that transparency that she could have. Because she could have been one of the most liked. That's one. The other issue is this thing called the Arkansas Project. If Hillary gets into power, the Arkansas Project will be revived. This was a project by the Republicans in 1992 when Bill Clinton came into power. This was a dirty tricks operation. It was basically dig up as much dirt as you can on Bill Clinton and then put it out there. Ruin his reputation. And this project, it was called the Arkansas Project, it was done by the Republican Party, and it was seen as, it was seen as, and that's part of the Clinton narrative. You know, there is this dirty, yes, there is this dirty trick, but you've given them some of the ammunition for it. They tried this with Barack Obama, just so you know. They tried it, they, they called it the Chicago Project. Never worked. They couldn't find any dirt in Obama, right? They have never yet been able to find out. Single bit of dirt on Barack Obama. That's probably what he's, he's scared of the shadow and beat the shit out of him. But, uh, uh, you know, but more importantly, you know, they have tried this. They tried this on Jimmy Carter. Other Democratic presidents couldn't find dirt on him. So here it was, this great talent for the 21st, you know, 20th century, 21st century president who could have gone into the pantheon of greats. Then there's this final thing about Vince Foster. Vince Foster was the deputy White House counsel. And there's this Republican rumor you will hear from time to time, Hillary Clinton murdered Vince Foster. <laughs> but no, she didn't. Right? Because Vince Foster committed suicide. Right? There is, I have seen enough evidence of Vince Foster suicide now, besides digging up the guy and asking for exhumation. You know, there's no other way. I can tell you, Vince Foster was suffering from depression. She committed suicide. No, you know, all the blogs and stuff. So, that talk about Vince Foster being murdered is just hogwash. So, how do we kind of feel about the Clintons? Well, the present Bill Clinton's job approval rate is average for 5%, one of the highest. <coughs> Uh, his highest approval rating, funny enough, was 73%. Just after they had an attempt to impeach him for, I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> but, I'm not doing good. but recently, 2014, when they did a survey about the most popular presidents of all time, right? and remember, this changes because you know, it depends on the mood of the country. <coughs> Bill Clinton came second after Ronald Reagan. But he's seen as the second most popular president. <coughs> so, polling throughout 2000 and 2010 have shown him to be in the top five of all time great presidents. And all time include people like Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, people like, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, Eisenhower, Roosevelt, you know. And he's come up as in the top five. And here's the other fact. Hillary Clinton, whenever she stands for election, <coughs> her approval ratings drop. When she is in a job, her <coughs> approval ratings go up. <coughs> so I think there is, you know, whatever you hear about Hillary, take that with a pinch of salt, because nine out of ten times, Hillary in job does a good yeah, comes through because it seems as doing a good job. Depends upon whose perspective you believe in. So, 
you've waited, you've had to hear a story. So who will win? I've got a secret. I know how to win this election. <laughs> Bill Clinton told me. And I told this to my politics students. I don't know if they remember how uh, they win. You see the states going from Minnesota right down to the bottom. Louisiana. Well, half of that is the Mississippi River. And everybody who's won the states adjoining the Mississippi River has gone on to be president. Here's my proof. Bill Clinton did it in 92-96. George Bush did it in the narrowly when he beat Al Gore. He won Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana. He did it again when he beat the Carthys. Barack Obama did it. He did it again. That's the secret to winning the US election. So, based on that, assuming there are no more revelations, it looks like either Clinton will win big, or Clinton will narrowly squeeze. Trump is a mountain to climb. It's an absolute mountain to climb. Because on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, of the picture, you have those two big states. Uh, big states of California, Oregon, and Washington. Those are solid blue. Blue, by the <coughs> way, is Democrat, red is Republican. <coughs> and the ones that are striped are the stripes that are battleground states. So the likely tally is going to be 272 to 187, or 307 to 180 in terms of electoral college. But what has happened <coughs> yesterday and day before about James Bone has had two effects. It has got, certainly the data that's coming in today has wiped out Clinton's poll. But remember, US elections are not like British elections. 22 million people had already voted by the time that came out. Right? So it wasn't as if, you know, wow, there's still all these people to vote. What that will, however, mean is that the likely sweep that the Democrats were expecting of the House, the Senate, and the presidency is unlikely to happen. Because Republicans would turn up and say, okay, you know what? I may not vote for Trump, but I'll vote for my senator. I'll vote for my congressman. Even though they may have supported Trump, because they want to control Hillary. Because that, in America, works through checks and balances. So, with that prediction, I want to finish. Hopefully, look forward to any questions you may have. about 10 minutes for questions, so if we start with Adam, then anyone else has questions. Uh, yeah, so very early on you said that Bill and Hillary kind of worked in tandem, like you're the tandem presidency. Is it likely that um, Bill will again kind of, well, hold a significant amount of power over the presidency again? And if so, how will the American pu uh, public uh, sort of respond to that, or even like legally, because of course of the... Uh, the sort of thing they well, have to restrict ladies, two terms. Just so you know, first ladies, or first gentlemen, as Bill is going to has always had influence <coughs> on their spouses as president. So it's not a new thing. Uh, they have always had influence, but they have had influence on the background. Bill will never hold a cabinet position. He will be given some sort of official thing. My guess is he will be given the economic portfolio uh, for Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton's focus will probably be foreign policy. <coughs> But that second part of uh, how, how would they respond to that because of the um, well, it depends upon restrictions of how much Trump Bill gets it. visibility of his role. <coughs> they didn't vote for Bill, they voted for Hillary, but they know that they're going to get. And Americans feel reasonably positive. They think he's too old to go chasing after women. We don't know. You know. Uh, but, uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, they think that, you know, 
they've probably put enough bromide in it to prevent him running off and misbehaving. But, um, you know, and assuming, you know, because this is one hell of an intelligent guy. This is not some, you know, this ain't no George W. Bush. This is, this is one of the brightest people America has had. So don't <coughs> underestimate whatever I've said about Bill Clinton's personal behavior. That does not take away from the fact that this is one of the most intelligent presidents who have ever held office in the, in the latter half of the 20th century. So don't, don't mistake that. So Americans will feel pretty positive because Bill had a good economic track record. Anyone else? Don't be shy. <laughs> I suppose I could ask about, do you have any predictions for any cabinet appointments by Hillary Clinton, oh. if she was to get it? My current <coughs> betting is that Joe Biden gets Secretary of State, which I think will be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the betting. Um, I know of certain other cabinet positions, because people have told me that they are pitching for jobs, but unfortunately I can't say those because they are these are people personal confidence. There is, uh, I know the guy who's going to be the guy who's going to become the uh, national terrorism, counter-terrorism guy. Uh, there will be a change of FBI director. That's definitely <laughs> <laughs> uh, possibly not of the CIA, but definitely a change of FBI director. Uh, there will be a change of a few changes. Some of the Obama cabinet will stay behind because, you know, uh, but things like the economic portfolio and stuff, I think Hillary will be put her people in. Uh, Hillary has a good affinity, you know, in terms of building bridges with mainstream Republicans. And assuming, you know, she did that in Senate, so if she can do that, and Obama had this as a challenge in his first term, and he, he, he was kind of very standoffish, very kind of offhand and he didn't build bridges, but Hillary definitely has that capability. So if the whole well hasn't been poisoned, and the whole thing hasn't gone toxic, and there are so many rumors on the net about people wanting to shoot Hillary and they can do stuff, and the whole thing about Hillary's biggest challenge is uniting the nation. And if she can do that, that will be her biggest legacy. Because currently, if you're an American and you're American, you know, you're either too embarrassed to admit you're American, or you're kind of saying, well, you know what, there is something seriously wrong with our country. So I think, you know, certainly I spent the last six months in Washington, and it's, it's not a nice place at the moment. Could you think Elizabeth Warren seemed like they Well, Elizabeth Warren was my choice for the Democratic Party. <coughs> I uh, was the one I supported. I uh, went out and did leaflets for her because I thought she was brilliant. Uh, Senator Warren, those of you who don't know, Trump has called her Papa Hunters because she, uh, yeah, she has Native American uh, blood in her. Senator Warren is an absolutely amazing woman. She is forthright. She has taken Trump on. She's a great public speaker. Hillary, unfortunately, is following Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and, to a certain extent, George Bush. George Bush publicly was very funny, but his speeches, he was a funny guy. <coughs> Bill Clinton was a great speaker, and Barack Obama, well, you've all seen Obama speak, and he's great. Hillary is not a good public speaker. Seth Warren, great public speaker, she rouses the crowd, Democrats love her, and I think if she gives her a portfolio, I hope she gives her a decent one, uh, though, you know, there, are, there is some doubt whether Hillary will actually do two terms. Because if the Republicans can reorganize and get themselves together, it might be a one-term presidency. Because you know, after Trump, the Republicans have to kind of figure out, hell, do we want to go down fighting every year, or, do, or every four years, or do we want to come back? And it may see a Republican party split apart, with one going towards Trump, one straight towards him. But that's what you know we're trying to be politics. It may be also that Trump, who is now if you go into Trump T V uh, on Facebook, it's great. You know, it's such high production values. <laughs> you know, Trump, you know, Trump's hotels, Trump's casinos, Trump's steak, and Trump's wine, and Trump everything. And so Trump has a business plan behind us.
So I guess, you know, unless he becomes president, then God help the world. Uh, but, you know, but then, you know, there are people that say, just on the final thing, there are people that say, and I'm one of those people that say, Trump does get into president, <coughs> it's not going to be the end of the world. Because the way the American constitutional system is governed, there are too many checks and balances for people, presidents to just get away with doing this stuff. So there is, there is that. But it would be good for a lot of, a lot of denial. Got time for one more. Uh, since we're on appointments, uh, what do you think is next for Bernie Sanders? Bernie Sanders, well, Bernie is at the moment a little of age. And, uh, but Bernie has started something which is very, very important in America. He has galvanized the Democratic young. Right? The, the Democratic Party was getting old. It was getting too white, too old, too boring. And, there, and yes, there was the Obama coalition of African Americans and Hispanics, but they went out and they voted for Obama. They'll probably vote for Hillary, certainly the African Americans will. But the young were leaving the Democratic Party in groups. Okay? They had not identified with the Democratic Party, I mean, basically your age group, had not identified with the Democratic Party. You know, and they were leaving. <coughs> what Bernie has done is brought those in. And that's one of the reasons I wanted. Uh, uh, Senator, um, well, Senator Warren, because I thought Senator Warren is the person that could bring the young and the old <coughs> together in the Democratic Party. And to my mind, she would have been a far better presidential candidate. And I haven't told you why Hillary actually got the job. Because for the last 15 years, every Democratic think tank is populated by Clinton inside it. All her people are in the key think tanks. So the people that influenced the thinking of the Democratic Party after she lost to Obama, sorry, not after 15 years, after, after the last 18, after she lost to Obama, she's put this program in place. So if you look at Center for American Progress, you left. All of the kind of think tanks are full of, uh, full of her people. And therefore, you know, so I hope. Uh, Back to <coughs> I hope Bernie stays, because Bernie is a force for democratic politics and for the Democratic Party, because certainly the way globalization has affected America. I mean, here's the thing. A state like Ohio and Pennsylvania, you would have never, ever thought would vote Republican or Trump. Right? Trump and Republican are two different things. <laughs> would vote Trump. Right? They're voting them to vote for Trump. And I reckon Ohio and Pennsylvania are more than likely to vote for Trump. Because these are blue-collar Democrats, and the blue-collar Democrats have lost out. This is what's happening in the UK and in the West, they have lost out. And they feel that America of Obama, America of Bush, has not represented them. America of Bush was still involved with wars. America of Obama has not been involved enough in doing things to bring in industry. Despite what Obama said about dropping unemployment. The, the blue collar, unskilled Democrats have not benefited. <coughs> and that's the constituency that Bernie Sanders was talking to. That was the constituency that he could have brought through. And that's the constituency that Senator Warren could have brought through. And I regret it, that hasn't happened. All right, can we give a big round of applause to DW? Tomorrow we've got another academic talk. We're joined by Hugo Dixon, who played quite a prominent role uh, in the Ink campaign. He was the founder of Common Ground, uh, and in fact, he's a writer as well, writer for The Guardian. Uh, and he'll be talking to us about what happens after Brexit. That's in the Oculus, room four in the Oculus. If you haven't been to the Oculus, come and see what it's all about. But once again, thank you to Dina. We are running a social, uh, the Terrace Bar is staying open until Friday in the morning. Uh, our presidential election night and WTV. Thank you very much.